I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to our final FastFit session titled Sustainability and Resilience. My name is Anil Ganti. I'm a fellow at RPE. And today, my colleagues and I are going to talk to you about, we're going to shed some light on some unseen and unsung infrastructure that might be critical to a net zero, sustainable, and resilient future. So with that, I think we're going to start with Dr. Simon Freeman. Just a reminder, actually, so um, please submit your questions via the QR code. Uh, I think you can use the one on your badge or the one that will flash up on the screen. Uh, we're going to go through four fast pitch sessions first, and then we'll have Q&A at the end. Thanks, Anil. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. So I'm going to talk about our unrequited love for the deep blue economy. My name is Simon Freeman. I'm a program director at RPE. So one of my favorite hobbies is scuba diving. And my wife calls it you know, an expensive hobby. But it turns out that she's more insightful than I realize. So this is one of my heroes, Jacques Cousteau. More than 70 years ago, he invented the aqualum, the thing on his back, that allowed people to live and work under the ocean. This invention led to a technology such as uh, offshore oil and gas. But Cousteau was a romantic. He imagined cities under the ocean. He imagined the ocean had a, it was a place that had the space and resources to house and feed tens of billions of people. And if you look at the numbers, he's right. The ocean covers 361 million square kilometers of the Earth's surface, more than 71%. And that means that 2.6 million quads or quadrillion BTUs of energy arrive on the surface of the ocean every year in the form of usable sunlight. And even just taking a small segment of that, almost 1,800 quads per year is available as wind energy input to the surface oceans. Compare those big numbers to slightly less than 100 quads per year. And that's the total amount of energy that we use in the United States from all sources. Consider also that the United States stands to gain a huge amount from a blue economy so this is a map of the US, and uh, including our exclusive maritime economic zone. So the blue area, or the purple area, is the territorial ocean that we own. And the area of that ocean is greater than our, the, the land area that we have. Considering the deep ocean, that's the ocean deeper than 50 meters or 150 feet, that area is still larger than the total land surface area that we own. And by deep blue economy, I'm talking about that dark purple zone. You know, beyond the horizon, beyond, say, three miles out to sea, uh, this is the area that, uh, that I'm really interested in. But when you look at it today, you know, our relationship with the ocean is a dysfunctional one. It is, the deep blue ocean is underutilized and under underappreciated. When you consider the one true scaled blue economy, it's offshore fishing. And while globally that industry uh, was worth about $141 billion in 2021, they enjoyed about $35 billion worth of subsidies. Compare those numbers to the $6 trillion global market for energy. And even considering renewables, we spent about $1.2 trillion on renewables R&D and implementation in 2022. So there's an enormous scope here for expanding the blue economy into energy and uh, you know, any, any changes in terms of how we harness renewable energy from the ocean are profoundly going to impact our energy economy. So I wondered, you know, why are we in this situation where things are underutilized? If you look at that picture, you know, there's almost nothing there except for one fishing boat. The cost of that picture is about $10,000 a day. So it's expensive to send people to sea. That's the reason. So how do we... Uh, how do we uh, rekindle our relationship with the ocean? I think that autonomy is the enabler to the blue economy. And by autonomy, I mean removing the people. This is something that we've done for a number of terrestrial industries. And these are, these are really hot off the press type um, industries here, experiencing rapid growth and a lot of innovation. So consider autonomous vehicles. Tens of billions of dollars has been, has been spent on the promise that we can remove people from driving. Uh, consider manufacturing and logistics, uh, the chance to save people from performing dangerous, menial, and boring work. Uh, and then consider the future defense economy. That's going to pivot around autonomy. 
uh, examples like this unmanned fighter jet here, they not only are a force multiplier, but they reduce the risk to our warfighter. So, you know, if one of those jets crashes, uh, none of our soldiers die. So, so much of this investment has been made in these terrestrial markets. And I think that it's time to start making similar levels of investment exist, exerting similar levels of effort in the marine economy. And that's because over the next 30 years, we're going to see profound changes in how we, uh, how we interact with the ocean and what we do in it. So a couple of examples here. By 2050, CO2 removal, or uh, negative carbon economies, carbon capture, whatever you want to call it, is going to be one of the biggest industries on the planet. And that's because just to stay below 2 degrees Celsius of global warming, we're going to need to remove 10 gigatons per year of CO2 from the atmosphere. But by 2100, that's 20 gigatons per year. Given that the ocean covers much of the Earth, it, only, it makes sense that we would do a lot of this, if not the majority, at sea. So I'm asking you here now, what are the technologies we're going to need to develop to make this happen? You know, autonomous systems, autonomous monitoring, autonomous dispersal of, say, biological materials, or uh, to create plankton blooms, or what have you. Consider also offshore renewables. You know, there's a lot of talk about offshore wind uh, over this last, last week. And we have 39 gigawatts of installed wind today, offshore wind. If you think that's a lot, consider the estimates by 2050, we think that we'll have between 634 and 1,240 gigawatts of installed offshore power, offshore wind. Uh, that, those wind turbines are going to take up a lot of space, and they're going to need to move offshore because of coastal use conflicts. In partnership with offshore wind, you have industries like seaweed farming. That's, that's hand in hand being developed in Europe at the moment as co-located renewable energy sources. Uh, think about the costs to maintain and repair these types of facilities or to perform cultivation when the facilities are far or much further out to sea. I think renewables are going, I think autonomy is going to be critical for this industry. A couple more here. Think about how we may feed 9.7 billion people by 2050. Given, especially considering that the incremental gains that we have with regards to the productivity of terrestrial agriculture are asymptotic. You know, the more money we put in, it's a, it's a diminishing return scenario, mainly because we only have a limited amount of land. That is not the case for aquaculture. So that presents a solution to a scenario where caloric demand may be between 30 and 62% greater than we have today. And just to mention, you know, we have more people, but those people are also going to be using more energy per day because the world will be warmer. The last topic, critical minerals, has also been something that's talked about a lot. Uh, we're going to need a lot more of them to transition to a net zero economy by 2050. And unless my colleague Doug Wicks has anything to do about it, do about it the supply of these crit critical minerals is going to be reduced by then. However, billions of tons of these critical minerals sit on the seafloor and dissolved in seawater in the open ocean. The challenge is not only the collection, but also the evaluation of environmental impact there. Uh, any solutions there are likely to be highly autonomous. So just a very simple example uh, of how autonomy can bring about uh, a, an acceleration of the blue economy. Consider today we have boats that are crewed. Uh, they have diesel engines. And if we, if we move to an uncrewed diesel situation, we immediately save about $1,000 per day cr per crew member. And in the middle there, that's an example of a, an un unmanned Navy vessel. But things go further than that. Once you have no crew, your vessel can stay out at sea uh, for as long as it's required to complete the mission. You don't have to come home because people need time off or they get sick or what have you. And that opens the door to real utility regarding renewables. If your vessel is renewably powered and it can harvest the energy at sea, uh, not only do you save the $5 a gallon it costs for marine diesel, you can stay out there almost perpetually. So there are some solutions in this space already, uh, and they're typified by these three examples, the sail drone, the liquid robotics wave glider. These are surface-dwelling autonomous sensor platforms that can stay out on the ocean for years. And then the DARPA manta ray program is something where they're trying to develop unmanned undersea vehicles that are energy harvesting for defense. This represents the state of the art today, and 
uh, all of these systems are very capable. I think the next step is to go beyond systems that sense to autonomous systems that do things, uh, do things to serve the upcoming economies like the ones that I showed you previously. So autonomy is the enabler for the deep blue economy, and the US Maritime Exclusive Economic Zone carries enormous potential for us. I'm asking you now, what ideas do you have that could waken the sleeping blue giant? Contact me at RPE, and I'll hand it back to Neil, who's going to speak about a large animal. Thank you, Simon. Can we get a different presentation, please? I'm not ready to <laughs> speak to this one. <laughs> Spoiler. I mean, you could give my talk for me. That would be interesting. That would be interesting, actually. That'd be a good. All right. Thanks again, Simon. My name is Daniel Ganti. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about how I think we can use urban water networks to beat the heat and reduce our peak demand. People often make the metaphor that cities are complex organisms. And like organisms, there are systems for communication, transportation, energy delivery, waste removal. In a lot of ways, this is an apt metaphor. And in sticking with that metaphor, then shouldn't cities keep cool the way that complex organisms do? The African elephant shown here will bathe itself in mud in heat conditions. And if we look closely at its cracked skin, we'll see a complex network of channels that enable airflow and maximize evaporative cooling effects. The reality is our cities have an overheating problem, and that, that's true across the country. We know this as the urban heat island effect. And this heat, it stresses our electrical grid as we all turn our air conditioners on in concert. A 2022 report by NERC found that large portions of the US grid are under stress during summer peak conditions. And cooling is a substantial part of our peak electrical demand. The graphic shown here shows an estimate of the fraction of our peak electrical demand for a few US cities on particularly hot days that was just due to air conditioning. The takeaway is that we're spending gigawatts of power just to keep our homes and our businesses cool. And by all indications, cooling demand, it's only projected to increase across the country. A report on hazardous heat found that the probability of consecutive hot days is going to dramatically increase from 2023 shown here to 2053 shown here. And let's talk about the other elephant in the room. Or is it actually a duck? There, how are we gonna meet this peak demand that is dominated by air conditioning? By and large, the current answer is short duration batteries, and a lot of them. The IEA net zero scenarios estimate that we would need 680 gigawatts of short duration battery storage just to meet our peak demands. At a cost target of $100 a kilowatt hour, that's about $270 billion. But what did humans do before air conditioning, refrigeration, batteries? We kept things cool with evaporative cooling. We kept food fresh in porous clay pots wrapped in a wet cloth. We kept rooms cool with clay structures designed to hold and evaporate a lot of water. We even designed our buildings around this concept with courtyards and fountains with cross breezes all to maximize evaporative cooling. So given its long success and history, I thought, can we cool entire cities this way? Well, let's look, at, let's look at some numbers and we'll see if the amount of water that you would need to do this is just insurmountable and represents a showstopper. And so I'm gonna look at the, the city of LA. If you wanted to cool the entire city, you would need to cool a volume of air equal to the city area times a mixing height, where the mixing height is the height to which you can expect air to be well mixed. It's roughly on the time scale of about an hour. For the city of LA in the summertime, that starts at about 400 meters in the morning, climbs to 770 meters in the afternoon. Okay, so with that range of mixing heights, you would need 500 million to a billion liters of water if you wanted to take the city from 32C, about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, to 25C, 
a cool and comfortable 77 degrees Fahrenheit, where you'd be leaving your windows open, and you would achieve about a, almost a gigawatt of electrical demand savings. Billion liters, that's a lot in hot and dry California. But if we compare it to the residential consumption of LA, that's seven billion liters of water. Or for that matter, how much water does it take to feed the population of LA under a typical American diet? That's 22 billion liters of water. The point is that to offset a significant fraction of the city's peak electrical demand via evaporative cooling, it's not unthinkable. And the reason that idea is feasible at all is because the latent energy of water is extremely high. It's two orders of magnitude higher than things that we traditionally think of as energy intensive when it comes to water. Things like pumping water uphill or producing fresh water from seawater via reverse osmosis. And given that, I challenge the audience to think about how water treatment assets, new, old, can be potentially electrical grid assets. Imagine a, a network of distributed water treatment and storage assets that are, that are soaking up curtailed renewable energy and then coupled to an evaporative cooling asset are then reducing our peak electrical, electrical demand. Our wastewater systems are enormous. We've invested billions of dollars into them and we will continue to invest into them. But currently, they're designed to just whisk water away from our cities. So I want folks in the audience to think of the enormous energy flows within these systems. That billions of liters translates to gigawatt, actually terawatt hours of latent energy. But what we need is to develop new ways to tap into these enormous flows to reduce our cooling needs and ultimately benefit the electrical grid. Now one obvious idea to reduce urban heat island effect is to regreen our cities. Sounds great. The problem is, you'd have to regreen our entire cities. The evapotranspiration rates of plants can be pretty slow. And while I would love to live in a city that looks like this, I don't think it's gonna happen tomorrow. So instead, I'm interested in engineered systems designed to leverage underutilized water, evaporate it quickly, efficiently, and reduce our need for air conditioning altogether. We can accomplish this first with distributed, intelligent water treatment and storage that makes large volumes of water available for cooling without competing with our fresh water supply. And second, with a new paradigm for sensing our urban environment at high spatial and temporal resolutions. And that data, it will power predictive microclimate models and control algorithms that can, that can optimally balance the water availability with grid anticipated grid conditions. And finally, those models and algorithms will be coupled to control or control purpose-built evaporative cooling systems that will reduce the microclimate temperatures and our need for air conditioning altogether. Let's zoom in on that first point for a minute. Currently, our wastewater systems are passive. Water flows downhill, and there are few, if any, controls on the system. But imagine if these systems operated more like a bi-directional microgrid. Imagine if there were sensors, controllable valves, inflatable dams, pumps, all things designed to capture a high quality stormwater runoff during wet conditions. And then in extreme heat conditions or in anticipation of them, these storage assets can then be triggered to a coupled evaporative cooling asset. Now what might that look like? One manifestation of this could be distributed gray water treatment coupled to evaporative cooling assets. So buildings produce gray water, and if we capture that, treat it using curtailed renewable energy, and then in anticipation of heat events, we pump that to the top of the, top of the building to an evaporative cooling asset, something like a porous media or large aerosolizers. Now finally, controlling the microclimate of an entire city, that sounds difficult, and it is. It's a non-trivial controls problem, and there are many design time and run time optimization or parameters that we could optimize, and optimal strategies are gonna look very different for a given environment and a climate. But regardless of the city, we'll need the ability to measure temperature, wind speed, relative humidity in new and volumetric ways in and above the urban canyon so that we can run fast and accurate microclimate models. Then we'll use those models to optimally design and operate 
evaporative cooling systems, things like large aerosolizers or large porous media. So if you're interested in talking about the untapped potential of our wastewater networks, if you're interested in cooling entire cities, if you work on large eddy simulations and want to talk about you know, computational fluid dynamics and how we can optimize those parameters, please come talk to me. I'll be at the coffee hour tomorrow morning, 7.30, whatever it is. Um, and you can also send me an email shown here. Thanks. With that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Marina Sofos. All right, well, thank you, Anil, and good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to continue the t on the topic of buildings, but I'd like to actually begin with the conclusion. The conclusion being the end of life for our construction materials. Now, demolition piles like these aren't just an eyesore. They can also be problematic from an emissions perspective, when over time, materials like wood or others that naturally store biogenic carbon begin to release carbon dioxide into the air with decay and decomposition, and even possibly form methane, depending on the disposal conditions. When degradation does occur, it'll be the result of either water, mold, sun damage, or failure of the surface coating, with one often leading to the other. And the outcome is a disruption of the structure within the cell walls, which consists of cellulose fibers and hemicellulose embedded in a matrix of lignin. Now, why does this matter? Well, building materials offer a unique opportunity in terms of complementing carbon dioxide removal strategies like reforestation and direct air capture, while also at the same time they continue to service what are gonna be our future construction needs. And so in recognition of that, ARPA-E launched a program last year called Hestia. But what I'd like to talk about today is that for non-mineral materials, where storage won't be permanent if the material experiences some type of physical event, and even though that process may take decades to actually happen, when we look at the very tight window we have with which to go negative and maintain temperatures below two degrees Celsius, we can't afford any additional emissions in the future, no matter how small they might be. And so we could envision additional emissions benefits from longer lasting carbon storage. It would mean fewer necessary harvests to replace those products which means more carbon dioxide can be sequestered for longer in standing trees, and the emissions associated with harvesting and manufacturing could also be delayed um, when making a new product. So for example, for trees that would, are planted today that would then be manufactured into a cross-laminated timber structure, or CLT, a 50% longer lifetime for the CLT could translate into additional sequestration that would then be the equivalent of offsetting the operational emissions of 60 homes per year for every CLT producing hectare. And so what I would like to pose to you today is what if we considered ways where rather than just improving upon the efficiency of our end-of-life processing, such as recycling, what if there was no end-of-life? How can we extend the service life of our biogenic products for longer carbon sequestration by further prolonging or even completely preventing decay mechanisms? When partial degradation does occur, in, in an otherwise intact component, would it be possible to repair that portion in situ 
and eliminate the need for a full or even a partial replacement. And finally, how could we implement design for disassembly practices in ways that can really enable the dismantlement of parts in the future and retain otherwise usable components? So if we look at current wood preservation chemistries and techniques, when failure does occur, it can be attributed um, typically due to the penetration, the depth of penetration, and retention of the preservative. Now, we could envision new chemistries or even new injection methods that could extend that lifetime even further. Um, other modification techniques could include those, uh, other techniques could include those like genetic modification, for example. Um, and just last month, uh, a company called Living Carbon announced their first planting of genetically modified trees in, the in a U.S. forest to enable heavy metal uptake for faster tree growth. So what if we were to, you know, implement those strategies to also think about ways in which we can extend the lifetime of that wood when it's manufactured into a product? Now, when degradation does occur, it's really worth looking at the lignin, because lignin it plays a very important role in terms of protecting that cell wall from microbial attack. And when the lignin degrades, it breaks down into these aromatic structures. And so early evidence suggests that you could actually reassemble the lignin. Um, but to do so, we really have to um, kind of pose the question, is it possible to control that polymerization in a targeted and a selected way such that those, the interactions with the cellular surface are still retained uh, without interfering with the overall structure um, and over-polymerizing, if you will? Would it also be possible to extract that damaged lignin from or, or pull it to the surface and repair it and still retain the overall structure? And then finally, designing for disassembly offers a very promising strategy in which to minimize um, the destructive teardown strategies that we use today, and which often re um, result in deconstruction of otherwise usable and intact pieces. And this is especially true when oftentimes we go through a building renovation, not because of failure of the material, but for aesthetic purposes or changes in use of the overall structure. So in the case of engineered woods, um, routes that are being investigated today would permit remo removable connections uh, without destroying the structure. And you know, one example of this is recent work out of University of Liverpool where they demonstrated an adhesive-free mass timber structure using densified wood dowels. And these routes are, could also be incredibly impactful because adhesives themselves have a high global warming potential. Now, unfortunately, the most cost competitive option today is typically a complete teardown. So we really have to work to uh, recover sufficient material from these types of strategies so that the higher labor costs can ultimately be offset. To address the uncertainties that still exist with these strategies, um, as, as promising as they are, uh, we have to look to um, further fleshing out and building out uh, design guidelines, because those are really critical uh, in, in getting into the code adoption process and ultimately uh, market acceptance. And, and furthermore, we really have to look at um, continuing down the path of simulation capabilities and, and predictive capabilities to better understand how long these techniques will truly last um, and, and in order to build further confidence. And so with that, uh, I want to thank you all this afternoon. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on ways in which we can shape our building construction beyond 2100 and think of our buildings as part of the climate solution, not part of the problem. Thank you.
Okay, uh, I'm going to last. Oh, um, all right, so back to the title. Uh, my name is Phil Sok Kim. I'm a program director, and I'm going to talk about technologies to ensure the reliability of a rapidly evolving grid. Electrification holds a great promise to decarbonize the world and mitigate the climate change, but it will wor work only if the power stays on. Let's put ourselves in the seat of the grid operator, and there seem to be lots of data and information flowing already. We have a primary, primary job to focus. Is the power on? Will it stay on? If not, what am I supposed to do now, right? So typically, we'll dispatch the crew out to find the fault and restore the power in the event of a failure. So what does a failure look like? For overhead power lines, the failure is obvious, very easy to locate. But for underground power lines, the failure looks like this. Locating underground power failure is like finding Waldo. It takes hours, and it might not be where you're looking. Oh, by the way, don't try hard. There's no Waldo. It's been photoshopped out. <laughs> but what if we didn't even have to deal with Waldo? Can we prevent power outages in the first place? To do that, can we detect incipient fault and predictive failure so that we can provide proactive and preventive maintenance before a catastrophic failure happens? As a result, can our operators just focus on maintaining the system health instead of reacting to an unplanned outage after the fact. Large-scale electrification means there will be a big change in how energy flows, and we've also heard about it yesterday from my fellow Jack Lunard. So how much energy is flowing in quad in the US? Today, for the majority of the energy flowing is in the form of fossil fuel. But literally, we're trying to flip it in the next three decades or so. So in addition to the energy story we heard about yesterday, I'm going to ask you the question, is our grid really ready to support this change? Today's power system is more likely, you know, one directional power flow top down from generation to transmission to local substation, and then to distribution and to the finally uh, un, uh, uh, the um, customers. But the future grid, or modern grid, will have a lot of renewable generation, which is variable, and we also will have lots of distributed generations, lots of DERs, more EVs on the road, smart grids, and they are all creating so-called bi-directional power flow, which really complicates the grid design. And therefore, medium voltage distribution, where this majority of the bi-directional flow uh, occurs will become even more important, and the reliability of the medium voltage power distribution becomes even more important. What is blinking now? By the way, this is where over 90% of the power failure occurs today. And it's getting worse. Why? Because of frequent and uh, harsh weather events due to climate change. We need to put them underground. Let, let, now, let's go back to the grid operator seat and think about this new trend in our grid. Our grid operators have all the tools, but our grid is rapidly evolving with new characteristics like more networked grid topology, dynamic power flow, more underground power systems, flexible loads, and growing issues like harmonics and so on. And these are just some examples that are co complicating our grid operator job ever more. Well, there are some incipient fault location and detection technologies out there. I've seen some of them, but most of them are sort of fixed and designed to do one type of functions, and they don't necessarily work really well when there's some change in the grid. They're not very reconfigurable or adaptive. 
and some sensors are very local, therefore the operators will still have to bring that thing and go through the manhole and scan them. It's not very safe to use. And sometimes the test methods used themselves are very disruptive and interfering our circuits. And in general, these existing solutions are very expensive to cover a large area. So the future next generation solutions for our changing grid will need to be adaptive and reconfigurable, should be able to monitor the whole system, and should be fully remote and automatic, and utilize non-destructive test methods. And they should be also be affordable. So where do we start? Well, when I'm trying to challenge a new, um, very difficult uh, problems, I often look at natural systems. And our body is a great example of a complicated network system. My brain, my nerve. So let's look at this. So we have a centralized system, our brain connected to central nervous system that controls and synchronizes our action pretty accurately. In addition to that, we have distributed peripheral nervous system. Like if we touch something hot, we instantaneously react to it. It doesn't even involve the brain. And our brain can learn from past experience through what's called the memory of pain so that we don't repeat the same mistakes again, like putting your hands on a, over a hot steam. And our systems are very adaptive and self heal Can we learn from these natural systems to design and, and come up with new sensors or new technologies to uh, detect power failures before it happens. What if we have distributed an adaptive grid sensor, just like our nervous system, behaving like a hybrid of central and peripheral nervous system? What I mean by this is sensors could record event-driven incipient fault signals with some level of edge processing. It has to become smart to selectively prioritize data reporting to function as a neuromorphic sensors. And the same sensors could also respond to local events instantaneously in less than maybe 20 milliseconds. And they could be designed reconfigurable so that they can adapt to changing grid conditions. In addition to these sensors, we also need something more central, just like our brain. So we also need centralized analytics that will essentially turn this grid data into actionable intelligence. What I mean by actionable intelligence for the grid operators is something like, do I go now or not? If I'm going, do I go and inspect? Go repair or go replace? So at the end of the day, what the grid operators really need is not just half a processed data or raw data. They just need a simple actionable intelligence like, is it green or yellow or red? To do that, the first step is having access to the data. The grid data access is a big problem because they're often siloed. So we need to really free the data and be able to securely share them. As a result, RPI currently has an open project with Ping Things, and they are developing an open platform uh, to be able to uh, securely store and share grid data. So that's the first step. But I think, you know, more and more people should be looking into this space. This is the first challenge. So let's assume we've done that. And with the data access, this brain-like function should be able to not only locate incipient fault with high accuracy, but also should be able to start identifying the nature of incipient faults so that the system will truly become a system that can learn. So let's go back to the grid operator room one last time. And let me turn this to you by asking these questions. Can you develop new tools for our grid operators that can deliver actionable accurate intelligence to prevent power outages. A diagnostic system telling something like in uh, line number 11 at 50 meters east of manhole number five will fail with 99% probability within a month. 
a system that can enhance the safety of our crew because every time they are going out, there's always OSHA challenge associated with it. And a solution that provides value to the system and the customers. So if you have any additional thoughts or any game-changing ideas, I would love to listen to you anytime. We need your imagination. Thank you. All right, with that, we'll jump into the Q&A session. Simon, you talked about the need for autonomy, but what new technology do you need to translate our knowledge from land to sea? Thanks, Anil. So what I spoke about was autonomy both above the surface of the ocean and also below the waves. So considering that above the ocean, uh, on the surface, you know, we have technology today that enables a high degree of autonomy and, and activity out there. I would say that underneath the ocean, you know, there are, is a technological frontier. Uh, key, in, there need to be a lot of innovations to enable us to go towards especially deeper parts of the ocean. Um, important technologies, I think, I can imagine, would be battery storage and distribution. Um, energy harvesting is something that uh, we already do at sea. So the transmission, distribution, and storage, I think, would be really important. Uh, one other issue is that you know, in order to pick things up, move things around in the ocean, you need some sort of buoyancy control. So imagine, you know, if, just like if a hot air balloon picks up a sandbag, it's going to be more difficult for the balloon to fly. Uh, and when it drops the sandbag, it's going to shoot up into the air. You need some mechanism to control the relative buoyancy of the device so that doesn't happen when you pick things up and drop things off. Thank you. Phil, a question for you. What is the impact of power loss or the financial benefit of having higher reliability and resilience? Well, yeah, I wish I know the exact answer, but you know there are a lot of uh, effort to uh, estimate it. But just to uh, give you an idea, I think there's a DOE report estimating the power loss in the U.S. costing somewhere around $80 billion to $150 per year. But with, with more electrification and reliance on the flow of electrons even more in the future, uh, the cost of not having reliability and resilience will go up dramatically. Thank you. Marina, your turn. Wouldn't it be a more effective strategy to rely more heavily on mineralization techniques that can sequester carbon on a centuries time scale? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, if we look at the projections, we're going to need uh, 5 to 20 gigatons of CO2 removal capacity per year by 2100 globally. That's a, a significant amount. And we manufacture uh, around 66 billion square feet a year. Uh, so I would argue we need both. Uh, we need both to meet our construction needs uh, because every, every building element operates uh, differently and has different requirements uh, from a performance perspective uh, and also just from a, a feedstock perspective. Uh, and we, we also need as many pathways as possible uh, to buy us time in the near term in terms of carbon dioxide removal, uh, and then to extend that um, to, to where we need to be in the future. All right, thank you. Question for myself. Would evaporating a billion liters of water cause local weather? That's a good question. Um, I, I think my answer to that is, you know, I first showed the slide on urban heat islands. Uh, you see, you know, almost plus 3C in cities. That was relative to the surrounding rural areas. So I think step one could just be you know, evaporating enough to get back to that background signal of what is, what is the surrounding rural environment look like. And so it's more you know, getting rid of the, the um, perturbation of, of the urban heat and getting back to what the, the environment should be. So it is, a, it is a little bit of a weather modification, but really it's getting back to what it should could have been originally. All right, let's go back to Phil, question for you. What types of failures are common on the grid currently? 
a type of failures? Types of failures, correct. Well, yeah, so for medium voltage distribution power lines, I would imagine we'll be undergrounding them much more, which means we'll be using insulated cables. And along these cables, uh, usually the insulators can fail over time because they age under high electric field over time. And also a lot of things fail at the joint. The joints and splice could be also monitored if there's any like you know, discharge of, 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 of a charge. Yeah. So those are the typical failure points. Karina, what do we currently know about repolymerizing wood? structural purposes? Um, yeah, that's also, that's a, also a really good question. Um, you know, it's certainly a pathway that's, that's being explored. Um, the, the, the challenge is doing so in uh, a controlled and selective way, um, so as still to be able to uh, retain uh, the overall uh, structure within the cell wall. Uh, but certainly there's kind of good evidence uh, to show um, that if you can uh, maintain those surface interactions between uh, the lignin and the cellulose, um, it could, you know, be a very promising strategy um, if, if you can also get the right, uh, the right catalyst to do it uh, in a kind of a batch economic way, which uh, can be a challenge as well. Thanks. Simon, why would you want to install a seaweed farm with offshore wind? It's an interesting question. So I think Amazon just funded the first co-located seaweed and wind turbine farm um, offshore in Europe. And this has been something that has been discussed for some time. Um, and especially in the context where, you know, the wind farm is generating millions of dollars per month, let's say, and the seaweed farm generates tens of thousands of dollars per month. Um, but there are a number of, of non-financial benefits. So firstly, generally people don't like may have some misgivings about uh, a wind turbine farm in their backyard, right? Uh, they feel differently about seaweed farms because there is a distributed economy there and it supports uh, coastal, uh, coastal economies. Secondly, um, there is a, an impetus for environmentally restorative work, restorative work and a seaweed farm is inherently like that. It absorbs pollutants from the environment such as nitrates and terrestrial runoff. And thirdly, it turns out that um, it's not that uncommon to have a ship crash into a wind turbine. This happens about one and a half times a year in Europe um, as, as a boat would lose power and, and, and drift in the wrong direction. So mechanically speaking, having a buffer zone, um, something to cushion uh, drifting sort of unpowered vessels, is something that would potentially drive down insurance premiums. So, and that, that may pay for the farm itself uh, in addition to the, the, the income generated from the farm. All right, thank you. Okay, question for myself. Should have been prepared for this one. How well would your evaporative cooling work in high humidity environments such as Washington DC in August versus your Los Angeles example? Well, I will say that for those of us that live in DC, you know, Rock Creek Park is like a haven in the summertime. The reality is, is that it still is subject to high evapotranspiration rates will keep it cooler. Part of it obviously is shade, but part of it, a large part of it is being close to a body of water. Uh, I know that when I walk down to the wharf in the summertime as well. Um, that being said, correct. High humidity will limit your rate, the, the, the rate at which you can evaporate water and limit the effectiveness of this. And you don't want to, you know, you're, really what you want to optimize for is, is uh, the UTCI index, Universal Thermal Comfort Index. Um, and this is where the sensing comes into play of like what can you actually achieve in the environment that you're in on the specific day that you're trying to operate in. Okay, Marina, you spoke mostly of end of life CO2 impacts. Are you thinking about innovations in operational energy as well? Uh, well, uh, you know, for this, th these purposes, um, you know, we're really thinking about the embodied carbon element um, of the equation, but, but obviously there's a, a very um, intimate relationship between um, the performance uh, of, a, of a product uh, in, a, in a real operational building um, and the uh, actual uh, uh, operational energy consumption. Um, and so, you know, I would say that in these situations when, 
when you have some kind of a degradation or need for repair, um, it, it impacts the overall operational uh, footprint of the, of the building. Um, but we also have all these instances where, you know, think about uh, us individually and personally where we want to, for, for aesthetic reasons, we want to make uh, a change in our, in our home and we go through these, you know, rather, you know, destructive teardown um, practices because it's cheaper, uh, and that 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 has an emissions footprint to it. So I think ways in which we can think about be be uh, more smart and practical if we're designing for disassembly. And so when we, you know, are going through those practices, we're, we're uh, not adding an emissions footprint when otherwise our our our, our building is operating uh, the way the way it should be and the way it was de designed to be. Phil, how do you incentivize grid operators to share data so intelligent grid management tools can be developed? That's a really good question. I think it will be improved reliability and resilience. You know, utility, if you look at the utility company's business model, they make money when they make uh, capital investment because they have a, a rate case and then through the rate payers, they can make a profit out, out of it. But in terms of operation, you know, unplanned outage is always a lot of cost for them. So by sharing this data, if there's a secure platform, uh, the return will be um, less unplanned outage and less unexpected spending on this operation. I think that would be the biggest um, uh, reward to them. Thank you. Simon, what do you think is the biggest limiting factor at the moment, keeping the blue economy from expanding? What overall innovations would aid in development of a sustainable offshore industry? So I think there's two competing things here. So I talked about autonomy being an enabler because the, the cost of labor was too high. Actually, if you consider, um, say, offshore versus onshore oil and gas, I think some, the, the salary differences are something on the order of like, uh, the average being 50K on land versus 75K in the ocean. Um, and uh, that, that's just one metric that indicates how much more expensive it is to have somebody do work at sea. There's another issue there, too, where I think, um, according to OSHA, the death rate of employees in offshore oil and gas is seven times that of onshore oil and gas. So it's, it's highly paid, but it's also dangerous. So it could cost you more than money. Uh, so that's one issue. But the other one, which is um, it, it's more complex, is permitting. So you know, we have technologies like offshore wind, and on land we have solar. And I think at some point there'll be limited utility in um, marine solar as well. Permitting is one of the, the biggest impediments to the rollout of these technologies. Um, you know, we live in a, a country where everybody has a say, and this is really important, and everyone needs to have a say uh, in terms of environmental impacts and, and um, economic impacts and so on. But I think that process could be made more efficient, uh, and that would dramatically assist in our transition to zero carbon. Thanks. Okay, a question for myself. A large portion of the heat island effect comes from paved surfaces instead of buildings. How do you see your plan? How do you see your plan cooling asphalt and also dealing with shortened life cycles and continued wet and dried cycles? I'll start by addressing the second one, which is uh, I didn't talk much in my talk about the need for new porous materials um, to both evaporate, you know, evaporate water effectively, but still serve as a structural material. Things that we can use, you know, on our sidewalks or in parking parking lots, things like that. Um, to address the point of, you know, the heat island effect coming from paved surfaces, correct, and people have tried, you know, reflective coatings is often the things that people say that we're going to do. We're going to, you know, paint all the roofs white, which is, by the way, mandated in California, and it should be. Um, but for paved surfaces, if you're going to blind every, you know, if you want to do that, you're going to blind every driver, and, and we can't do that. And, and you know, realist, the, the realistic albedo differences that we can get, it only amounts to, you know, like under 100 watts per square meter. And so, you know, with, with evaporation, you get mass transfer that just dramatically increases the watts per square meter of cooling that you can get relative to, you know, trying to do albedo engineering. 
Marina, how does the interface between renewable materials like wood and single-use materials affect the way we design construction? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, one, one example, I, I guess, not, uh, not sure, the single-use was there a more? Got nothing more. Uh, yeah, <laughs> renewable materials like wood versus single-use materials. Um, I guess, you know, you spoke in your talk about adhesives. I mean, that's certainly... Yeah, really yeah, so yeah, material. that could, yeah, that could definitely, you know, um, it was, you know, going, going to answer with the, uh, the joints and the connections um, where, uh, you know, often, uh, oftentimes what, what leads to the need for a, a replacement um, is that those joining methods are, are such that you, you can't really reuse the parts afterwards. Um, and... Uh, ways, ways in which we can minimize um, adhesives is also kind of valuable from a from an emissions um, from embodying emissions footprint. Uh, we don't use as as much adhesive as kind of the rest of the structure, but uh, they have high high uh, global warming uh, potentials. And um, while there is kind of a wealth of bioadhesives going going back to to antiquity, we we tend to default to um, you know, the petroleum-derived ones today. All right. Thanks. Uh, with that, I think we're just about out of time. Thank you all for attending, um, sticking around, you know, and know the delays kind of push us back a little bit, but we appreciate your time. Yeah. Thanks.